everyone that here's another episode of cinematics is a very special cinematics because we're starting off the show with a filmmaker that all three of us really love bruce perky and eric Cohen. by the way i'm speaking for you right now and then you guys can add into the intro i've always loved the films of mark ponton ever since i started on the radio press junket tour so mark great thank you for, so much for being with us another time for again thanks thanks for having me so mark you're here for your new film survive it's not really a new film because of the Quibi situation. Can you just tell us the origins of it? And then obviously, I have I always have this fantasy of filmmakers and editors being in their room, just never wanting to leave and just spending months and years on a project. What was the editing process like for Survive? Because it's I was just thinking of you in a just a, a room, just putting the images together. Well, you know, it actually is a new movie because it's actually a movie it's a feature length who knows the, these are the days of like where the word movie and film are really being kind of redefined right so if in the old days it was like you'd go to a theater and have the experience of watching the film then you'd watch it again in some sort of alternative smaller screen space dvd or or at home correct now with streaming and everything that has become i think for the most part the primary way that you know narrative content is consumed so it's really like it, last night we screened this film called survive which we made three years ago as a series 12 part eight minute to nine minute chapters for quibi the short form app that was supposed to be on the go you know, eight minute movies broken up into chapters. They lured everybody from Del Toro to Spielberg to everybody in the world wanted to make Quibi. In the short sighted history of Hollywood, people forget that like Quibi would let you say, make your movie. We're basically going to license it for short form exclusive mobile content. You get the rights back after 18 months and you could sell your movie to a streamer or whoever you want, to a studio globally. So, I mean, think about it. You're basically being loaned the money to make your movie as long as they just, you have it for the phone and you can go sell it elsewhere. I mean, that's a crazy deal. That's a crazy deal. So they exploited their talent relationships with people and creative freedom and said, I mean, that's great. They had the money, they built up a studio of content, a library of content that they can exploit and own on the mobile devices. They didn't count for that, number one, telling people they can only have it on a phone and not being able to watch it on their computer or TV, right? That was kind of like, all right, well, people don't want to be told where they can't watch something. So that was a little bit of hubris. You know, it was also that was meant to be their kind of their corner, right? We're going to let people watch it on the bus. Well, if you think about it, I, I the other day was watching two episodes of something on my TV. Then I watched another episode on my iPad. Then I watched two episodes on my phone. Then I watched the final two episodes on my laptop. So I spread the viewing of a eight part series out over four different devices, correct? But if you're saying you're only going to use that one device, I think you're really limiting people. So that was technology, right? Then it just collapsed. The COVID collapsed. And they marketed it as such like, here's everything in a buffet. Your strawberry shortcake and your thousand island dressing and your prime rib is all on the same pl platter. No distinction. So as a filmmaker, you make a movie an adventure movie with two great actors, Sophie Turner and Corey Hawkins, you know, an, an epic movie, a two hour movie, 115 minutes, whatever it is, but it's broken up into chapters. And so when they review it like TV and only review the first three episodes, well, the first three episodes of this are a girl in a, in a mental health facility who's convinced that she's going to go home and kill herself. Anybody watching this would have thought it was a teen melodrama about suicide. 
that's immediately turned tons of people off. They didn't even know that it was a survival story. So there's a lot of like missteps along the way that I just made it as a movie. So last night we screened it feature length. It went this circuit, this route of like Roku bought all the Quibi stuff and still is pieces. But before we finished, we made a feature version. We strung the episodes together, added a couple more, stretched out some big landscapes, which you can do for a big screen, not just on a phone. And we were able to make a feature version that I felt good about to have in the can to sell down the road. And sure enough, the deals fell apart, Quibi collapsed. So thank God we had this piece. We had the file, we had the digital file, the mixed piece. And it ended up with this, you know, newer company called Freestyle that is really a gatekeeper to, you know, as I've learned these platforms and there's direct TV and there's Apple TV and there's all these ways that these movies get seen all the way down to cable, right? So it's going to get out there. And as a filmmaker, you just want your work to get seen. You want to be able to email your brother-in-law and say, hey, check out my new movie. You can go on iTunes or Apple TV. You just want it to be seen, right? So that's what we did. That long story, forgive me, is really just to tell the uninitiated about the history of it, Quibi. And to all intents and purposes, the viewer doesn't know, right? They're just saying, oh, what survived? Oh, Sophie Turner. And maybe they'll see the trailer and it's a pretty cool little trailer. And maybe they'll check it out and watch a movie with a lot of heart and uh, a lot of, you know, some cool stuff, but also it's saying something about surviving mental health challenges. When you, when you made this knowing, well, I assume you knew ahead of time that this was mostly going to play on TV, but uh, you mentioned like the big vistas and of course, like all the beautiful shots of the mountains. Uh, did anything go in your head as far as uh, this is going to be a phone? I have to shoot it in a certain way or, or you just, you just went straight for theatrical release. And if it pairs down and works on the phone, great. And if not, hopefully it'll be in a theater later down the road. Well, we thought it was going to be in a theater. We were under the assumption that yes, this was, you're going to make it for Quibi and it'll be on the phone, but then it will find its ultimate life on in a theater, in a theater. Like yeah, I'm agnostic. I don't shoot something just for a phone. I mean, I've been making stuff for 40 <laughs> years and TV. I mean, you, you frame, you frame for what you frame. Right. So it was this thing of like horizontal or vertical you know, you're just like, you couldn't put people way, way, way far on the left of frame. Or if you did, you just do a little resize. So you shoot a, a, a Monstra 8K, you can repost stuff. But this gimmick of like, hey, I want to watch it like this or watch it like that was, it was really marketing. You know, I mean, you, you've sat, you've watched stuff at home, right? You've watched it vertical, you've watched it horizontal. I think that was the idea of trying to be a little too clever I, I shot it to be seen in a movie theater, but I, I mean, I also like close-ups too, right? Which work great on a phone, but I'm talking back to like early 2000s, late nineties before, you know, when you're like, wait a second, you do a music video and the record come and say, well, we can't do split screens because if people watch this on the phone, the image will be too small. Well, that's just, that's the size of the screen. So what are you making things for? What screen do you make things for? And ultimately the image should work whatever screen it, you know, it, it is intended for. My daughter is used to watching stuff on her TV or her phone, way more than big screen, right? But we're all conditioned. We were brought up watching movies on a big screen where that controls you rather than you controlling the size of the screen. But it's just, there are different experiences. I've watched Survive now on the phone and a big screen. And this particular story with the vistas and adventure and avalanches plays really good on a big screen. Like yeah. the movie Cliffhanger. Have you ever watched Cliffhanger? Oh yeah. yeah. Great For movie. Sure. Not as good on your phone. It's still a good movie, right? Still good. Rennie Harlan at his best. 
Yeah. So, you know, whatever. Now I just make shit and like wherever it's going to be seen, it's going to be seen. I've been, I've felt that way for the last 10 years, to be honest with you. Mark, I, I just really love the film on, on the sense that you, you mentioned it. It's a very cool film. People can watch it on a level of escapist fare to, to have a good time watching Survive. It really personally struck me on a, on a, res, a very resonant level on how, how do you, the, the actual title survive is how does one get through the day and you know how does one process one's own trauma and be able to move forward in life can how much does it mean for you to make films that on one level could be entertaining but then there's so much more beneath the surface like survive and then after watching this i, I just can't wait to go and get i mean this is a tangent go check out the severing so i know two different movies but i think i can be swim in some kind of creative world as far as processing my own personal traumas how much is that how much how important is that for you as an artist to explore these themes well, yeah i mean to do it in a way to explore unprocessed trauma and loss via a girl that goes on a plane thinking she's going to do one thing then her life turns out to be the other way and goes from the top of a mountain down to the bottom and finds the will to live in a narrative plot driven thing with music and adventure and drone shots and avalanches and all those things. That was a commercial enterprise where I read the script. I was like, I could do a good job on this. It was a job. And I was like, as an interpretive artist, I was like, I think I could do a good job on it. It was the same thing that struck me about Mothman prophecies, where I was like, I, I'm into this topic and in this theme and work closely with the writers to really like put all of myself into it. The Severing is a dance film, which is experimental and like for, for this many people, right? It's for like four people. This is for 4 million people. And hopefully people can discover it. And that's the good thing about social media. I think it's like, if people see this movie and a younger people discover it with mental health problems going crazy, I was blown away last night after the screening, how people responded to this movie. Because nobody's seen it. Nobody has fucking seen it. The few people that really loved it that watched the whole series on Quibi, right? Only watched it in doses. But nobody's seen the big... The whole thing unfold as a movie from young to old last night. I was blown away and I was pretty critical of it. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Is it a little this or that? Like I was shocked. I was shocked the chord that it struck because of that thing of like, we're all lost and mental health and the world fucking crazy. And this girl goes through the sink because she's Sophie Turner is really great in the movie. The performances are really good. And it's about two people who grow to care for each other through a difficult ordeal. And so I think emotionally, it really, like, I was very surprised at the range of response to it, you know, and which feels good. It feels good. And it'll be out there. So you just hope that people discover it and discover it and Look, I, I'm sorry, I'm probably windbagging. I got an email the other day or something on social media 11 years after I made a movie called I Melt With You, which was a really dark, fucked up movie that I made in 2011 about four guys that kill themselves, right? And it's a, it's a you know, allegory about male failure and like a dark version of a Cassavetes movie where these four guys all realize in their 40s that like, they're, they've not fulfilled the promise, right? And very symbolic and really fucked up and very polarizing. And it got eviscerated when it came out. It's becoming a cult film. And this guy sends me this message. I watched the movie with my mother and we talked about it for hours. We loved it. But this is 11 years after you make this movie. The fact that it's out there in the universe, it'll always be there. Somebody could always discover it and tell somebody else about it. And you guys could see it and tell people and find something and like, that's the great thing about it. But if we can just get it out into this system of ones and zeros, right? Then you have a shot. Then you have a shot for something to be seen. Because we know now, I was just looking at a movie 
I was like, when is that Shailene Woodley, Ben Mendelsohn thriller going to not cost <laughs> me $20 to rent? I'm like, what company? Master Gardener I can rent for $6.99, right? Schrader wrote a script for me. I'm like, I'm not paying $19 to rent a Shailene Woodley FBI thriller. I like her. The trailer looks good, but I'm not going to pay 20 bucks for that fucking thing, right? <laughs> But it's on my phone and it's on my little thing. And like, it's out in that little, you know, little thumbnail, like every other movie. And they're there immediately, right? They were just in the theaters, right? Yeah. So you were talking about were... people to go watch Blackberry. I'm like, just watch. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely a great one. Both are good movies, actually. So. Is the Shailene Woodley a good one? Oh, yeah. We all Fantastic. really like that movie a lot. Yeah, so you didn't pay 20 bucks to see it. We did not. <laughs> but I'm offended. You know, it's like, and I'm like, who distributes that? Or what's the deal? Because I understand maybe in the first couple of weeks, like, oh, her, uh, the hypnotic, the Rodriguez thing with Ben Affleck, right? Which I kind of like want to hate see, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but like, like, I don't think it's going to be that good, but I, I'll still watch it at home. But like, it's at a reasonable price, right? But why is that Shailene Woodley thing still so expensive to to rent? Well, yeah, I know. We had a big I will say this about, to push back. Oh, I'm sorry. I, go ahead. I was gonna say we had a lot of discussion about that movie, about like all the barriers to seeing it. We're not talking about your movie right now. Um about all the the barriers are to watch it, you know, the, just the title alone and all this stuff. And we were saying this neat movie needs to be seen. And like you said, they're putting up these things to keeping for people from seeing it. But Let's talk about your movie for a second, okay, because that's sorry. what we should be talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to get to the nuts and bolts of your movie. So as I was watching it, uh, I was because the first part sets, everything's going, you know, you understand that. Then the plane crash. I'm not going to get into all the details, but I thought, OK, maybe this isn't going to take place out in nature and in the real world. But then it looked like a lot of this was on location. And I wonder how tough or not tough was the shoot and what was that all about because it looks like it's a pretty inhospitable location for actors and crew to be in it was fucking really difficult so the crash you know the uh, the crash is all like subjective be with her with the crash right you never see the exterior of a plane falling apart right like just right this was a 40 day shoot, eight and a half million dollar budget movie, right? But knowing that, designing it to be at nighttime, and when she wakes up, like the Wizard of Oz, and she walks out the door, we were truly on the top of a mountaintop in the Dolomites in the Italian Alps. So those right. night shots were at night. We're, we're outside too. So the night shot when she comes out oh, in the okay. snow and all yeah. the flip, that's all done on a stage. That was all done okay. at oh, an okay. indoor soccer stadium in Latvia. Okay, gotcha. We shot the movie in Latvia and the Italian Alps. Latvia, you might as well shoot in Georgia or a, right. It's an incentive thing. The budget's cheaper and good crews, you know, good support crews. Um, and you bring in your keys and all that nighttime stuff was all created on a stage where you could control the fire and the snow and stuff like that. Um, and then the, the broken airplane parts, like literally like 25 foot chunks of broken, destroyed airplane cockpits, cabins and stuff was trucked to the Alps, to Italy, airlifted to the top of like, because the Dolomites have six or seven ski resorts where the gondolas take you up, but like it's one's really, one, they're all rocky, but they're incredible. So the, it was supposed to be like the kind of Western Northern Rockies kind of, you know, around like Montana, Wyoming, stuff like that, right? And in the story so you're looking for a place that we were sure was going to have snow although we didn't always get snow when we wanted it you know where there's some production resources so you're shooting in cortina which is at the base of the italian alps and they airlifted the shit to the top 
of the Alps to the top of these mountains would would wind was so windy that they would strap it down. Now, up until four days before shooting, there was there was this much snow on the ground. And we're like, guys, what are we gonna do? Like, we're screwed. You're not gonna digitally, you're gonna digitally make all that <laughs> snow. They were so the weather forecast, snow's coming in. And sure enough, the day before we're shooting, they dumped like four feet of snow on it. So much that, in fact, we had to have about 40 Italian guys who created like a pathway, like probably five feet high for us to get out to the plane to push our way out where it, like, it was up on a level where it's maybe three feet deep of snow where you had to then get the actors out there, place the cameras, cover up the snow so it looked like virgin snow with drone shots, right? This is fucking not easy. <laughs> yeah, right? It didn't sound like it's it. Getting, it's going to get dark at 3.30 and you got to schlep the crew. So when I want, but it was real. All of it was real. The Not a CGI shot in there on the Alps. Them walking across from one place to the other. We had scouted them. They go here. Then they have to come down the rocks, around the thing. And we kind of had picked all the locations and said, okay, here's where the, it's like half snow. You knew that you had to have full snow for the first tier of it, then the avalanche. But then after the cave, you knew that they could go up and then down to a place where it's rocky and then greenery. As he says, you just keep going down. You got to keep like telling the audience the logic of, they got to keep going down to get to the woods, to get to the river, to get to a road or a town, right? That's, which is true in that place. When you first scout it, you're like, you'd lift it. You're like, there's only one way to go. It's down, right? So it was incredibly epic, incredibly challenging, but you prep it and we got lucky with some stuff, but the snow came in so fast. So if you recall the scene where she sits there and he goes, we got to go. The snow is coming. That was real. Like the shot, the wide shot of them trudging through the snow, mm -hmm. like the storm came in about five minutes later. So we had to do basically two days work in about six hours uh, because the then the next day, it was all the plane, everything was covered. So continuity, like really, really hard to try and try and control, you know, in terms of the schedule. There's a really tiny moment. It's uh, not to get too much into it, but uh, one of the characters touches a wound on another one. And they're like, uh, oh, sorry about that. It, it looked kind of like a, it didn't look like it was uh, something written. Uh, someone touches someone's stomach. And the person reacts and oh oh sorry no no it's it's fine. Would, would, is stuff like that? Is that something written or is that something where the actors are kind of playing a little bit? Because the moment's really tiny, but I thought it was oh, really it's... realistic to how something like that might play out. Yeah, no, I mean you 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 had to establish early on that he had internal injuries, right? And the first time is in the back of the thing, and you see something, and it's dark, and he's got dark skin, so you see like a something's going on. It's not till later where there's ostensibly like a little more morning light on it. You see it's deep and bruised, like an internal injury that gets worse and worse looking. You know, when you've had like a deep bruise, it's like, that's that's bad looking. So it was meant to just be like ah, tender, like tender to the touch. Like if you went out to go, does that hurt? You don't even have to touch it before you realize how screwed up it is. So you had to have the arc of injury for him. So then it was harder for him to move. And then he falls and breaks his, um, you know, splits his, his whether arm was it his arm yeah. or his leg or something like that, that she sets for him. Hey. So, <laughs> you know, so he goes, he goes physically, he's deteriorating physically. Right. But on terms of will, he starts strong and is like, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go to the point where he, you know, can't go anymore. And she has to change her arc from being like, fine, I want to die to begrudgingly go ahead to where then she becomes the protector. So there's a little bit of a shift. 
So yeah, physically, everything you have to kind of physically track where every character is at every beat, you know? Also, uh, speaking of shifts, um, because you were talking, last time you and Greg were talking about, you talked about like success, but I believe you were talking about success in the sense that the movie comes out and it does well or it does not. There's also another type of success, like an artistic success. Uh, Also, like you mentioned, like a movie comes out doesn't do well but it finds a it finds an audience later on that's kind of like the uh, back and forth kind of what you're describing with the uh strength and losing the strength and vice versa what what's kind of your thoughts on just success uh the financial success of the movie and the stress that comes with that versus the artistic success that maybe comes later on there's like oh this thing uh didn't pick up and then like decades later people love it and they're like hey all right. I've never made a movie that made any money. So the two biggest movies I made, Arlington Road and Mothman Prophecies, neither of them made any money. They were made in a system, 1999 and 2002, they were made in a system that feels like the 1940s. Like in looking at the, the way the movie business was and the way it is now, you know, up until streaming and really like the movie, there was a movie business up until about, 2012, 2014, you know, when streamers started, when Netflix started to come in and home video started to decline, then the economic model, you know, changed and collapsed. So I remember one time somebody said something, well, you've never lost money for people. Like I've never had one movie that's been a hit, right? Not one. They've all found their audience. Mothman Prophecies is a cult movie now. 20 years after we made it, uh, I think, because we just didn't show who the scary guy was and it kind of had a tone to it. Arlington Road, we kill the bad, we kill the hero. Okay, well, there you're going to limit your audience by killing the hero in the archetype of an action movie where it's geared to be like, and he's going to save the day. It subverts those expectations. Mothman, we don't explain what happens. So you've got ambiguity, which is going to eliminate half of your audience. Then I made a bunch of small, weird, dark, personal movies that nobody saw, but I enjoyed making them because every big commercial movie that I was attached to never got made. You know, a remake of The Orphanage for Guillermo del Toro, I really wanted to make that. That never happened. Other ones, so... I've never been sitting there not wanting to make bigger movies, but nobody's asked and you just make. So Survive was actually a chance to come back. It was like, wait, this is a big budget. This is kind of a commercial movie. It was a chance to kind of get back into that, you know, into that realm of something that somebody might actually go see. Um, And then I went sideways. So I don't know. Like my father played pro football for 12 years, right? He was never like an all pro, but he was respected. So I think I still got a little bit of respect, but success, what success? Does the young lady who did Candyman, Nia DaCosta, she's a talented filmmaker. Now she's doing a Marvel movie. Is that considered success because she's doing a Marvel movie? I did commercials for 30 years. I've I've taken my orders from corporations big time. I know what it's like to be like, I'm just a hired hand. I've done TV pilots, you know, so it's, and I've had final cut on movies. It doesn't matter. There's no success. It's you make something and does it find an audience, you know? I made music videos in the day where like these things were huge. Music videos were like as culturally important as movies were. Pearl Jam's Jeremy, it's like, holy fuck. Like, if that was a movie, probably more people saw that video than any movie I've ever made before. I think there's a certain group of people that, uh, especially during the time, where uh, would have liked to see that Jeremy movie. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a BC Boy sabotage. It's like, yeah. I remember that movie came out. It's like, or the movie, the, the video came out, and like all my friends are like, ooh can't wait to see this movie it's like it's a music video but yeah like, <laughs> know, i love to see it as a movie too my, they're my favorite form i think they're my favorite form of storytelling so when i made survive i was like maybe it started around 2015 i made this short film for this music i was like 
I'm just going to shoot everything the same way. I don't care whether it's TV or a music video or a movie. There are different skill sets, but after you've made some movies, you understand character and arcs and plot. And I'm going to apply that to videos and then videos. I'm going to, I'm just going to shoot like a motherfucker, direct the actors. So my videos start getting bigger and bigger and more expansive and like 13 minute uh, Imagine Dragons videos and Demi Lovato eight minute short films. Like, so these are all on my website. And it's like, I just said, I'm just going to shoot everything the same way apply my brain to it, unconscious, conscious, you know, it's just a question of how many trucks are on the street, right? You have 50 trucks and it's a big union pilot for a TV show, or is it everything in a van and there's 11 people on the crew? I don't, I don't care. It's all cameras and people and, you know, stuff like that. Mark, final uh, couple of questions here. Physical media, the severing is was recently came out uh, via Kino. Can you tell us a little bit about that physical media release? And going all the way, your cut, the the expanded cut, cut yeah. director's cut, which I, I think is a masterpiece. Uh, is oh, it? Uh, what is? Yeah, is it coming out on home entertainment as well? And then yeah, that's you know, coming the, out. They're both coming out. Kino released this. Okay, the severing is this dark, beautiful, seventy-five minute abstract dance film that is out on Blu-ray. And it's on the Kino Now platform. And I think you can find uh, other platforms. I don't know how these things work in terms of like the BOD. I know, I know that if you just go to Kino Now, you can see it. And whoever buys Blu-rays, it's a great Blu-ray to own. Um, going all the way to the director's edit, the multi-disc set with documentary and everything is I think coming out in about six weeks, but that's on, and the movie itself is on Amazon and stuff like that. And that was my recut of my first movie that I was just grateful to a cool company like Oscilloscope that gave me the bread to re-edit it. You know, I did that for free over COVID, just worked for a year, but a chance to redo the first movie, 50 minutes of new footage, a new score, voiceover. It was like a chance to redo your first like take your first articles that you guys have written or your first big pieces of pieces, like go redo them 25 years later. It was very satisfying. Mark, before we get to Bruce's final question, you mentioned earlier in the interview about windbagging. I love Sorry. You, I, I love your windbagging. And I, I'm going to ask you again, <laughs> when are you going to do your own podcast? Because I am yes. going to be the first subscriber. I don't care if each episode is three hours. I'll listen to every single second. When is that going to happen? I know you're a busy filmmaker, but is that go ever going to be a reality? <laughs> All right. So, well, we can keep going and I'll shut up and only answer questions. If, if uh, <laughs> um, I'm doing a, I, I wrote a book that's coming out next year and it's kind of like a 40 year, it's called The Visualist and it's going to be like, it's literally all this stuff. Like, what are your thoughts on this? What was it like doing this 40 years of image making and telling stories in all these different mediums? So I think trying to tie together a podcast with that, and maybe I get different people on, you know, like, oh, somebody that was in one of the videos, like my creative partners on these things. Um, I just did, got Jeff Bridges and Tim Robbins together to do a, a Zoom interview for the first time for a French Blu-ray for Arlington Road. It was so much fun. All I did was schedule them to talk, you know? And I was like, that would be really fun to do and get like, you know, get, get different people you've worked with on whatever the project, just to talk about process and experience and tell stories and stuff like that. Um, finally, Bruce. Uh, yeah, so usually we ask everybody this similar question, but when it's a filmmaker like yourself, and I do a little variation on it, and we ask various people that we talk to, filmmakers, friends, whatever, to throw, literally give us a movie to go into my box here. And uh, every week I pick one out and I watch it and we talk about it. Usually something that's underloved or underappreciated or underseen in your opinion. But when you have a filmmaker, we like to say, what are, and you've kind of danced around this already, what are a couple movies that you 
would suggest I put in the box. So we will talk about those movies whenever they get picked out. What is the movies that you think are underseen or underappreciated that we need to talk about and see? No pressure. You've only got a few to uh, How many do you have? A <laughs> hundred? <laughs> well, okay. So I don't know, like, is this for you or your audience? Yes. <laughs> it's for the audience and well, us. I don't know how many people have seen Under the Skin. Has everybody seen Under the Skin? I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Under the the skin? Jonathan, Jonathan Glazer's. Yeah. Oh, Scarlett movie. Johansson? Yeah. Yes. Like, you know, that's, that's that, that one's great. It's worth seeing again, even if we have seen it, because he's a, his newest one's coming out this year. Yeah. I think it just won can, didn't it? It was like, I got, well, I got a big prize there. But like, yeah, yeah. that movie like really inspired me. That movie really, really inspired me. And in honor of Treat Williams, who passed away yesterday, people should watch Prince of the City. Yes. Lumet's two and a half hour masterpiece of crime, corruption, New York City. Two and a half hours. Like it's just like Oh, you mean the, the length of the average superhero movie? Yeah. <laughs> Sidney Lumet is like a god to me. Like he really, really like um We're we're on we're on board with Sidney Lumet. Yeah. But you're I'm every, not letting you off the hook. Filmmaker should watch, should read making movies. Sidney yeah, Lumet's one. You're not off the hook. You have to pick one of your own too. One of my own? Yes. I melt with you. Okay, there you go. I want more people to watch that movie. Because I think it was very ahead of its time in terms of the the toxic male, uh, and 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 has a lot of heart. And I think the performances in it are really really strong. And it just provoked such strong reaction in people that was so polarizing. I'm like, how do you review a movie if you walked out of it? Like, like, uh, well, how can you review that movie if you you know, and it was at the beginning. I've seen criticism change over the years from like real reviewers to other reviewers to then bloggers. And then like I've seen the nature of criticism change and the personal attacks. And but I really, really like that film and I think it holds up. I just watched it and it feels very much of this time now. And it was made 11 years ago. Very cool. I got, a, you got uh, one last one. Yeah, I got a. I don't know if there's an answer for this, but I'm looking at your IMDb. Additional crew: Jerry Maguire, um, uh, credited as bachelor party film consultant. Do you know <laughs> what that is? I acted in that movie. I, I know you did, but I'm I'm looking at the additional crew. Uh, yes, thing I where made it's... early on in the movie. I step off of an elevator with Tom Cruise. I play his best friend. Cameron Crowe was a friend of mine and uh, had come to some commercial shoots where I was doing at that time, a lot of sports commercials, you know? And so in that world of sports and stuff like that, he uh, cast me as Cruz's best friend. And in the film, I make a movie for Jerry's bachelor party. So Cameron interviewed all these people and I helped edit the film that was supposed to be the movie within the movie from like 11 minutes to five minutes to three minutes. And it played back on the, you know, it became very, very small thing. So I was the, me and my partner, Tom Gorai were the bachelor party consultants on that film. We made the bachelor party film. Sweet. Really love Survive. Mark, thank you so much again for your time. And next time I'm going to make sure you're out will be in four hours, not 42 minutes. So get ready, get ready for Any, that. Anytime, guys. I appreciate you watching it, watching the work. And, and thanks for your uh, open ears and patience. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. See you soon.